Hey there, this is Manisha. Welcome back to part 2 of The Indian Boss with Steve Kurya, author of The Indian Boss at Work, Thinking Global, Acting Indian. Last week's episode received tremendous response, and here is what some listeners had to say. RC says the conversation was very insightful and invigorating, curious and eagerly looking forward to part 2. Raja says he thoroughly enjoyed the conversation when an author easily blends Indian cultural lassi into a world-class cocktail, the end result is not just refreshing but also invigorating. If the interviewer has a patient here and the guest isn't just boisterous and chest thumping, the conversation is simply enthralling. All years now for part 2. While Leslie says, "What a fabulous conversation! Delightfully incisive, and just keeps you wanting for more." I can't wait to read what the book unfolds. Congratulations, Steve, for such free expression, and Manisha for being such a fantastic host. Thanks, guys. That's terrific feedback. In today's episode, we continue our conversation focusing on Indian affinity to communities, balancing a multi-generational workforce, gender fluidity in the Indian leader. an imbalance in the way we treat women in society and at the workplace now in your book the indian boss at work you argue that indians have strong linkages to their communities almost to the exclusion of others how does that drive his or her decisions and the outlook towards business and the larger community in which they operate you really have a paradox you have a country for 7000 years that has had sanatan dharma which is uh, an inclusion of all faiths and all practices you had the uh, the jewish synagogue in uh, south india you had the church even before the formal church got established in uh, rome you had uh, a mosque and you've had a continuous synchronicity uh, nature of absorption of multiple cultures and and so on in fact the word hindu uh, for instance uh, only originated as a term in the british did a survey in 1832 a census and and people started to for the first time grasp the notion of this something called hindu, uh, hindu as a term but having explained that we are we we live together in complete acceptance there is no assimilation such as like in like in the us everyone goes into one melting pot and they all become you know one in in, in a similar homogeneous manner india is very welcoming and protective it's like imagine uh, manisha a bowl filled filled with bubbles so you've got various people coexisting like the parsis came they lived, lived in india but they didn't mix with the do that what they not do so you have a constant number of bubbles living together but there are not much of mix and matching in terms of their complete absorption and these bubbles can be very small it can be just my family my my religion my community it can become a bit more expansive like the rcb cricket which is all about bangalore and it can even expand during a crisis and become all india when it comes to perhaps a potential war with a neighboring country so this bubble which is small or it can become middle size or it can become large or it can contract and expand is what i call i think in english you'd call it a in group or an out group in in india we call it the apna and the paraya and obviously when you have in groups apna and paraya that the outside outsider you create a a boundary and in that boundary you project adversarial notions of what the other would do to you you have more protected to those who you you love and to those who love you and many of the ills we see is about the is about the mismanagement of the borders in, in india in terms of what we do uh, with regards to protecting our apna and we are, end up with looking after them and th- therefore perhaps nepotism is uh, is quite different because in, in in an apna world you are supposed to help your in group and then you have the adversarial world in which you can freely take them on and and so on and so forth so this book really talks about what is mine what who is the other and it can become a big problem manisha in an organization when instead of forgetting that you work for the customer and you work for various stakeholders 
you start to make apna and paraya within functions within departments and within people or within communities or within classes and you bring the outside in uh, and uh, those dramas of, of apna and paraya play itself out oh i love that explanation i'm a <laughs> bit of a cultural <laughs> cocktail myself we seem to be constantly wondering how we can be together the way we are a lot of things that you talk about i'm not sure how many youngsters actually follow that you know understanding kal desh patra or understanding that there are four varnas there's so much history to everything that's actually being talked about how does therefore the indian leader balance the opinions of this new millennial gen z sort of a culture uh, within the family structure of the business while nurturing their innate curiosity so there's so many thoughts that you've spawned manisha first is that the essence of indianness is in its acceptance and co-living and co-holding uh, the plural the plurality the multiplicity and to be able to not tolerate but to live with the differences because really it is our unity that brings us together and recognizing this ours is a wonderful nation that has got a lot of elements of individualism and collectivity now when it comes to the young i believe that many folks are perhaps reasonably ignorant about the rich tradition that we have the, the new education policy talks about you know bringing back sanskrit and so on many countries italy spain you see them love their own literature and talk about it and are seeped into it and and in our country for instance uh, we rather read milton uh, to uh, to kabir or valmiki we we ape that which is the west and forget we wear western clothes which are branded but we forget the wonderful beefs that we that we have we forget all our own tradition in many ways it's really about discovering the past because india has been a very powerful country for thousands of years a golden uh, a golden chilia it is perhaps in the 200 years perhaps a few years before that that we lost the plot and uh, we started to really sag and my book talks about the ancient inheritance and um, the modern legacy today so i think it's if we were to create a resurgence if we are to create a geography if we are to have pride then we have to visit its history the history that belongs to us and not which has been in a sense distorted uh, for us and to really understand who we are and therefore going up the river to the gangotri the source facing all the tributaries is an important element for all of the young folks to actually enter and i would really welcome them on this journey now i have a lot of hope for young leaders who are coming into both family businesses and into multinationals and so on for one many of the children from traditional family businesses have gone to western uh, universities that trained there have picked up friends from large parts of the world they see new businesses they new they see new trends they have built the network and they have been given important roles uh, in the organization especially in new businesses and international businesses and i can see a professionalism coming in my book talks to at least one very senior spotlight leader who talks about how he has moved from the past and what they have done to actually you know seize the moment clearly in 1990 when manmohan you know liberalized the country it was the the family business that transition adopted new practices that uh, were innovative and actually stole a march across all multinationals to really go up there in front and and and, and have a winning proposition so i am filled with a, a lot of hope about the young folks their adaptability of the digital world the startups the new age businesses and india is a, a young country with tremendous potential in manisha for instance this whole service orientation is something we learned just quite recently india has always been a country of family businesses for ages and ages for instance and in one of my chapters i i talk about the possibility for india to to discover itself and for the young to create and become you know world entrepreneurs steve don't you think that there is also this argumentative side to us you know you give any indian an instruction especially in the workplace setting it will come out in as many ways possible as it can be done as opposed to simply carrying out 
an instruction. And that is something that I see as a business owner, that nothing that you give them as an instruction comes back exactly in the way you intended for it to be. Mm, mm. <laughs> mm. And that's very different from your experience when you work with your Western counterparts, because there they follow the spec and you give them, this is the spec sheet. This is how I want something to be done. It will be done exactly to those specs. But here you have different interpretations. Manisha, one of the hypotheses I have is nothing wrong with the memory. For years, our entire scriptures was, was passed on from generation to, to generation through memory. We have a powerful memory. And if, if you look at all the spelling tests, the Indians have every year been very successful kids in terms of memory. The, the issue is that uh, Indians are creative, innovative, and at the same time, intellect, intellectually motivated. And so something which is very routine, very boring, one would find very creative ways of being able to solve it and, and, and sort it out and so on. You see this in the way codes are written. You see this in the way people go about their work. Uh, and when I take this down to many things, for example, someone says, I'm going to send this mail to you in the evening, but he sends it the next day uh, and so on and so forth. Or, you know, there is a whole notion of uh, how the West sees time, mm-hmm. which is, you know, which is uh, sequential. But Indians have this whole notion of, you know, uh, everything is uh, the three murti, preservation, destruction, creation, time is forever, it's cyclical, our music is cyclical to a Western ballet. (laughs) So this whole thing about the way time is held and many other notions needs to be understood. So I think some of the things, Manisha, you talked about, if if I may, come from a heterocentric hearsay comment about what Indians are. I want to offer a perspective. Maybe I'm straying a bit, but for instance, the way power is seen, somebody would from a Western world say that, you know, he's very submissive and he listens to his boss and and, and just follows it. He doesn't have a backbone. But the reality is power in India is really something celebrated. We celebrate the surrender to a guru. We celebrate the surrender because we believe in our our tradition. That is through surrender that true learning happens. And, and there are many such ways of looking. I think, Manisha, the book will help reader take a look at the darshanas, the looking, not from what has been a, a Western lens, but to develop new eyes to see. The book really, like as they say, you know, in the Indian tradition, there is a manana to understand the words, uh, the shravana to understand, manana to understand it deeply and contemplate it. And the third is to really live it. And I'm hoping that this book offers everyone new ways of looking at the kaleidoscope in such a manner that one is able to see the richness of our own possibilities and the possibilities of our Indianness. Steve, so far we've spoken about, you know, the Indian boss. At the start of the show, you had said there is a fluidity that we can sort of balance out both this and that, right? As Indian leaders. If you look at our scriptures, there are lots of female goddesses, but at the workplace, there is still such a large gap and women are trying to break into it. And there's a rather a terrible story about how we've sort of woven women back into the workplace or even in society. Can you explain this? Manisha, firstly, let me start by saying that we have double standards as a society. It is ironical that in our culture, which is replete with task spangled pantheon of deities, riding tigers, slaying evil and showering good fortune, we respect several women goddesses, Saraswati, Lakshmi, Durga, yet we see inequality and discrimination almost over 7,000 years, except for a brief moment. Worse still, every day, we see crimes of feminine feticide, sexual abuse, rape, kidnapping, domestic violence. And the fact is that 93% of all these cases is by a perpetrator from a family member, a relative or a friend known to the victim. So what do I say? While women are espoused as being deified, they are treated in reality far from referential. The issue really is about the patriarchy that has existed from years back, from Adam and Eve, from the notions of Ram and Sita, the way the woman is characterized. She belongs to a group of of being a spouse or being a mother or being a daughter, but who she is 
her own individuality. Uh, she cannot be seen in any other eyes, but in, pure, in, in, in the pure eyes. Her own desires, if they were to be demonstrated or manifest, gets social disapproval. Now, let me take, take that into the, uh, into the workplace. I mean, it's terrible. I, my book does you know, a lot of research and I have just kept aside all Western research because it's a, it's a problem universally, but I've stuck to really bringing the research back into India. Women end up choosing careers before even they get to the workplace, which are more feminine rather than male, which, which I've got the majority of males. So, you, they, so they end up firstly deselecting themselves. When they get into the organization itself, there's an IC climate. There's a labyrinth, there, are, there is broken rung, there are huge problems in terms of how, you know, the, the kinds of stuff that she has to face in the workplace, the kind of male prejudice that, ex that, that exists, the, the leaky pipeline. And it's only recent, and it's only then that we come to this whole notion of the glass ceiling, which is at, at a further stage that's there. So, so that's one, that's at the workplace. At the same time, because of her, the primary role that she has in the workplace, there is expectation for her and at all points of time. When the rubber hits the road during a crisis, the woman leader is expected to take a back seat and, and accommodate. So she's really you know, caught between on, on both sides. And a lot of women who are successful have had a price to pay, you know, intended, unintended, uh, and, and its consequences. So there are some terrible myths I have talked about. I have exposed in the book that you know, there are some jobs for women, some are men. All of those are untrue, they're inaccurate. We must stop talking, Manisha, about things like unconscious bias and nonsense. The reality is that we have incompetent, immature leadership that must call it out for what it is, that we must have a workplace that goes beyond tokenism, symbolism. I, for example, believe that we need to take some very, very clear actions left to itself. And in the pace we are progressing, it would take, you know, a hundred years. And a lot of women that I've spoken to despair that in their lifetime, they don't actually see any significant change, though they, of course, admit to progress being made. I have a number of spotlight leaders who are on the, on, in the book, Naina, Kiran, and, you know, Renana Jabwala, for instance, who's done stellar work in the area of building 1.8 million grassroots leader. It is moments like that that make me feel that there is hope. Remember, we're not just talking, Manisha, about 200 companies that make it to the top of the charts on formal organizations. 50% uh, of the country are women, but they have very low participation in the workplace. Uh, some of the good companies know what to do, know what to do, are doing the best they can. But that's not the issue. The issue is to making certain that the upliftment of women, their self-reliance and their empowerment is, a, is an imperative for a country to progress. This is not about men and women. This is about the, the, the entire country taking steps to welcome its new age, its new resurgence. I'm glad you call that out, Steve, and that's powerful stuff. So that section should really be of a lot of interest to you know, organizations and leaders. Do you suggest a way forward out of this conundrum? Like I said, firstly, to stop discussing this notion, this issue, of inclusion and diversity by talking about feminine and masculine. I think that's a big mistake. I think the more we talk about these are feminine traits, masculine traits, and this is who we are, and you know, uh, men are born in Mars and the Venus and that kind of orientation, it has a big problem. The problem is that it widens the gap between men and women rather than bridge it. And why do I say that? Our Indian tradition has confirm time and time again that we are within us the Nar and the Nari, the Purush and the Prakriti, that we have both that is with us. Our, God, our gods have got a sword and a kamal. Our goddesses have got uh, accessories and, uh, and a sword. And unless the woman embraces the courageous, the, the sword in her, unless the men uh, in, uh, you know, embrace the, the, the flower in them and have that in integration which you know, Jung would call the individuation and others have called the yin and yang. And Jung has also talked about the anima and the animus. And, and there are many other research that confirms for this integration of man and woman. The Indian society and particularly men, unlike the West, Manisha, 
have a mix of the masculine and the feminine. And therefore, many of the things that we have learned from Western psychology, like the Oedipus complex, do not play itself through uh, in this world. So that's one, is to be able to integrate rather than to segregate is one. And two, for real leaders to step forward and not just invite people to the dance, but to pick someone to dance with. To me, that's really about diversity and integration, to help people play it out rather than just, you know, come up with symbolism. And there are lots of people that are working at, uh, at the grassroots level. We need fundamental changes from on all aspects. We need changes that are happening in society. I mean, you look at, for example, the parliament and uh, many things. For years, they've been talking about representation. So unless we start, start to get top positions, role model positions to change, we're not going to be able to, to, to move the needle there much. Well said. <laughs> Steve, we're going to shift gears a little bit now. Right. Sure. I have in season two introduced rapid fire questions. So while we collaborated on a lot of things, you have no idea what's going to hit you right now. So are you ready? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Okay. First question. Indian boss or Western boss? Who would you pick? Western, West Indian. Yeah, come on. Cop out answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but okay. seriously. You want, one, need, one, one needs to find the integration okay. rather than just be Western or Indian. Okay. Second question. A woman boss or male boss, who's more approachable? I think it's all up to you how you make yourself approachable rather than the boss. Okay. So. Okay. I sense a pattern over here. The third, one, <laughs> third one, You've. I'm really going to put you on the spot on this one. So turmeric latte or haldi dood? I'll take latte. Mr. Turmeric. Okay. <laughs> Done very well under pressure over here, Mr. Steve Korea. I'm sweating, Manisha. <laughs> okay. On that note, thank you so much thank for you sharing for your me. perspective on the Indian boss at work. Clearly, it's been very diligently researched, exhaustively compiled, and you've gone and met uh, so many Indian leaders. And it, it seems like something that people should definitely pick up. Now, I know that pre-ordering has begun. And one can go and pick up a book on uh, stevecorea.co. Is that it? Yes. So thank you so much for being here. And when can we expect the book to be on shelves? Mid-November, early December. We shall follow up once again sometime in December. Catch up and see how the book is doing and uh, what's been the response. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. We've reached the end of season two. Love all the feedback you send me. Here is a special shout out to Yash. Yash, you've been such a super trooper and helped me with great leads and introductions. Keep them coming, buddy. Season three rolls on September 3rd with a hair raising episode of a professional rock climber. Do subscribe so you never miss an episode. Finally, here's a request from me. If you love the podcast, send it to a friend. If you dislike it, share it with an enemy. That's it from me. See you on September 3rd. Keep calm and carry on.